I have survived over 1500 days in hardcore Minecraft and today I want to show you my world. In this video I'll go over everything I have built and done in these 1500 days in more detail. There are even a few things I have never shown in a video as well. And without further ado, grab some snacks, stay hydrated and enjoy the world tour. This is where everything started. Over 1500 days ago I spawned right around here. Over in the distance you can already spot a little something. But before we check that out, let me show you what I have built here at spawn. This is the mob switch I have been using for some time now. Using zombie villagers we can disable all mob spawning in the world. They are right on the border of the spawn chunks. When using mob based farms we'll have to move them out of the spawn chunks to enable mob spawning again. So there are three villager breeders that supply us with villagers. All we need to do is trade with them once, turn them into a zombie villager and then send them either into the overworld chamber or to the nether to have a mob switch there as well. This one here is actually broken at the moment. Some of the zombies have died and the mob cab is not filled anymore. I will redesign this whole thing in the next video though. Alright then, from spawn I first headed over in this direction. Over here are still some tracks when I collected some iron and coal. This here is the very first cherry grove biome I have ever come across. At the time I decided to head further and I set up my first base on that little mountain. Currently everything in this world is centered around this base so I'll use this as a reference point for basically everything. Inside there was the dragon egg and the first pickaxe of the world before I moved them to the current base. In the corner is the enchanting setup. Here is some extra storage, a pile of ores and the mine. This is an infinite water source and over here is a cat tree with some slightly neglected cats. They will come into play in a future video though. I also have this nether ward farm and a reading corner. That's basically all that's downstairs. However, there are also three secrets I have never shown before. Pressing this button, it retracts this bookshelf to reveal this hidden barrel. I used to store some rare enchantment books like swift sneak in there. Behind this trapdoor is another barrel which I have never used. Same thing with this one here. I added this little secret but never found a use for it. Upstairs is a cozy bed, a small smelter and the first storage. There are the basic workstations, some sugarcane and other useful workstations. That's all there is to the starter base, which I stayed in for 1000 days until I eventually built a new base and moved out. Then leaving the base, to the left is the barn, which I never showed from the outside I believe. In here are animals like cows, chickens, pigs and sheep. There's food and water for all of them, even though the water dispenser doesn't really make sense. Just out front is the nether portal, which looks really cool. I tried to mimic all the five nether biomes in this design. I think it turned out great. Following the path down here, there is a little farm. It has potatoes, carrots and wheat. It was mostly just decoration, but I still used it here and there for carrots in a villager breeder or wheat for some packed mud blocks. Right next to it is this little pond, which I am super happy with. It just fits right in and looks amazing. As a little detail, I also added this spring. The water simply flows through the path and into the pond. Further over here is a trading hall. There are fletchers, which were used for getting emeralds in the beginning, librarians with mending, efficiency and unbreaking, and for farmers for golden carrots. By pressing the note block, the villager gets lowered and could be attacked by a zombie. The zombie isn't there anymore though. Something I haven't shown are these other villagers. These didn't fit in the trading hall anymore, however they are still extremely useful. They have basically all the other enchantments like sharpness, looting and so on. And up here is the villager breather. Throwing an item right there, which pops up back here, will give us a villager. And here is the input for minecarts. Little bit of a weird activation method, but hey, you gotta try something new every now and then. The actual villager breather is buried underground. The baby is falling in this water stream and gets sorted in this segment. Adults will swim up and wait until we need them. And this is the mechanism for the upper portion of this. Then walking down this path we get to the farming district. This bit here looks really good with the stone brick walls supporting the pathway. Anyways, let's start with the pumpkin slash melon farm. It's a really basic design but it works really great. Then the next one is the cactus farm. Again, a very simple design. The silos are really tall in case I wanted to expand these farms upwards if I needed a lot more of these resources but so far that hasn't been the case yet. This one is the sugarcane farm which supplies me with one half of the materials for all the rockets. The wheat farm is the largest one of them all. There's still a lot of space to expand should I feel the need to. And the last silo is the bamboo farm which is a modified design of the sugarcane farm. Then a little side note, this space used to be open but I terraformed that some time ago. Underneath the starter base is still the redstone for the firework show I did for celebrating 1000 days. I didn't cover up this part over here. This is where I usually went down for mining. I didn't actually use the mine inside the base very often as it was meant for strip mining. However, caving in large open spaces is much more fun and usually even more efficient as well. Then to the left of the random ticked farms is a simple cocoa bean farm for brown dye. It's a pretty fast farm as well even though it is really small. Just across are three farms in this one building. There is a glow lichen farm, a dye farm which was mainly used for cornflowers to get blue dye and a string duper. This actually isn't the first one I had built. Before I had this official one I used a temporary one that was hidden under the 
trading hall. Anyways, all the way over here is a cobblestone farm with shulker loaders attached. I think the decoration could be better, but still, the farm helped a lot for crafting pistons and observers. Walking up here, we get to the iron farm. There are actually three of them, which served me very well up until this point. They are built a little bit too close to one another, which slows down the rates quite a bit, but I never felt the need that I should rebuild it. This neat building is the super smelter. There are the input and output chest, and back here is the fuel input. It uses 64 furnaces to reach a reasonable speed. Just over here is the snow farm, which is really simple to build and use. Continuing this path, we reach the universal tree farm, meaning it can farm 11 different types of trees and fungi. I modified the original design a little bit to adjust to my needs and make it easier to use. Then, let's first look at this over here. This is the moss farm, which has helped a lot as well along the way, and that wraps up all the farms in the starter area. However, there is one more building back there. This is the armor trim factory, where I display all 16 armor trims in all 10 different colors on a full netherite set to flex on everybody. This was the biggest project so far in this world, and up there is the same armor trim pattern as the one on my actual armor, just in gold instead of amethyst. In the back is the crafting station. It only sometimes works, but for the most part it makes duplicating all the trims and netherite upgrades a lot easier. On the right hand side is the selector panel. Across is a panel showing us how much of each material we currently have, and also the lectern which defines how many trims we want to duplicate. I designed this myself, so it's far from perfect, but I think it did its job. Now, there's a few things I never mentioned, and I'd like to show them now. Let's just head to the other side of the starter mountain. Here, I occasionally farmed azalea trees for the leaves, mushrooms before I had the tree farm, and this is also where I farmed the cherry leaves for the nether hub, which we'll get to later. In this ravine is a geode that I completely mined out at some point, which I used to get tinted glass for the slime farm, for example. Then, in this flat area, you can see some dirt piles. This is where some of the Halloween mobs are trapped. I have two of each of them, however, I am not sure whether strays can spawn with pumpkins as well. If so, then that would be the only one that's missing. Then further east is the slime farm with the AFK spawn all the way up there. Before I built the farm here, this is where I used to get the first bits of slime balls manually and also most of the gunpowder for all the rockets in the beginning until I had built the raid farm. Yeah, there are just a few creeper holes as a remnant of those battles. Then going to the nether, this portal with the cherry wood in the corners is the starter base. You can use that as a reference as to where everything is in relation to that. This portal is just a snow biome next to the armor trim factory where I get my eyes from. Through the skulk portal is a deep dark where I built a warden switch. This allows me to loot ancient cities without having to worry about warden spawning. It's also still part of the spawn chunk, so it doesn't even require a chunk loader either. Then let's continue with the nether farms. The first one is just down here, it is the piglin bartering farm. Further down are the filters and the shulker loaders with the storage. Below is the actual nether where we can see the wither skeleton farm and the blaze farm. Let's leave this place as the nether mob switch is currently broken and mobs are spawning. Back on the nether roof is a simple basalt farm. This part is the AFK spot for the wither skeleton farm, and in this dirt structure are the Halloween wither skeletons, and that's also where the AFK spot used to be. Back then, I had accidentally built a gold farm too close to this one, reducing its rates. Later, I simply moved the wither skeleton farm a couple of blocks back. Then, flying south, we can see the nether side of the guardian farm, and this portal leads to the raid farm. So yeah, this is the raid farm, and over there is the overworld part of the guardian farm as well. The raid farm is built here, as there is a lot of water to spawn proof the raid farm, and also there's a pillager out post in the distance, but after initially starting the farm, it always extracts a captain, so there's no need to fly to the outpost for bad omen anymore. The next two things on the list are the infinite boars. They are super overpowered tunnel boars, which allowed me to get a lot of diamonds and netherite for both duplicating the armor trims and upgrading to netherite for the armor trim display I showed you earlier. This one is the one in the overworld. It's definitely a bit more complicated to use, but it's super useful. A lot of the items have already despawned as these chunks were loaded here and there. However, further back, there should still be plenty of items lying around. But yeah, this area stretches about 5,000 blocks. Now then, let's fly away to keep the items from despawning. So when any cobble deep slate or tough blocks, I can just come here and collect shulker boxes of it in a matter of minutes. Back on the nether roof, we can find the infinity bore in the nether. This little platform is the AFK spot for this one. But yeah, same machine here. And down here is the affected area, where you can still see where I pillared up to collect the ancient debris. Then I'd like to focus on the end. This is the first stronghold that I found, and also I built a sand duper right here. If you want to dupe concrete powder, that is stored in there. On the other side of the portal is a concrete factory. This allows for farming solid concrete immediately instead of duping only the powdered form. This lever can switch from powder mode to solid concrete. This part over here is for the obsidian farm. The overworld side to this one we'll see a little later. Down here is just a basic storage for all the sand, 
concrete and obsidian. In the distance is the Skulk farm. It works like an Enderman farm but turns their XP into Skulk. Standing here we get moved from side to side and can collect all the Skulk blocks. Some of the pillars are missing some obsidian as I was collecting it this way before I built the barging farm or the obsidian farm. Then through the first of four end gates is the honey farm. The sound engine breaks here because there are too many entities. Down below is the bee breeder. The babies can fly through the gap and fly into the hives in front. They can't get out again because there's a block in front of them. On top are three hexagonal modules with an overcomplicated farm design I made myself. It works very well and is extremely fast as there are almost 1000 bees in total. The reason it is built in the end is because there is no day night cycle and therefore the bees are working all the time. Moving on to the second gate. There are basically no chorus fruits anymore. I had to farm a lot of them for the nether hub either for the end rods or the purple blocks. This is also where I then found my first elytra. If you remember this little clip Yeah, this happened right here. The third one is actually nothing. It was the first gateway I unlocked where I made my way over to the previous gateway, but there is nothing interesting there. And the last one is all the way in the back where I built a shulker farm. It has an end city right there, which made it a lot easier to get a shulker into the farm. That's all there is to the gates. And at last is the wither rose farm. It's a really easy farm to get you started on a few wither roses. And that's it for the end. Now, let's finally move on to the nether hub and the main base. This giant tree is called the Tree of Veneration. It was an absolute massive grind to build, but it looks fantastic. I am super proud of this project and I think it's my best build so far. In the center, I can access the nether below by simply flying through the hollow trunk. Back there, you can also see the infinite ball from before. And right where the tree is split in half is a floating crystal which holds the nether portal to my base. Now, the base I have already shown in much more detail, so I'll just quickly go over all the features. Starting at this end is a map room which is still empty as the projects I want to map out haven't been built yet. Then the brewing setup was changed in the last episode. Now it looks slightly different but works flawlessly. Across is the smelter, here are some other workstations, there is the enchanting setup, in the middle is the nether portal we just came through, next is the bed and the end portal as the base was built where a stronghold used to be, then here are the villagers I can trade with to get food and a few books I will update every episode. And at last is the achievement hall where also the dragon egg and the first pickaxe of this world are stored. Across the nether portal is the slime launcher which leads us to the storage where all of my items are. It has multi-item sorting, works 100% reliably and I even added an auto chunk loading system as well to further prevent issues when unloading this area. And this is what the base looks like from outside. It's an active meteor shower with a massive crater. One thing I want to mention is that I needed a lot of grass to reconnect the terrain around it to the crater itself. I'll show you where I acquired all the grass later as well so keep that in mind. The smaller meteors are empty and only the largest one houses the entire functional part of the base. Then let's look at the remaining portals in this world. These lead to various locations for farming different resources. They are not that important but I still wanted to show them to you. The first one is the mangrove swamp. This is where I got all the mangrove wood from although I haven't really used it in too many builds so far. I also found the original frogs here that I used to get more frogs for the froglight farm I had to remove last episode. Then just further over here is a coral reef. Not much more to this one. Then as mentioned earlier there's an overworld side to the obsidian farm which is through here. It's a really simple farm so there is isn't much to show for. Then the portal I use the most out of these less important ones is this one. On the other side is a desert and more importantly a badlands biome for terracotta. So whenever there's a montage where I get terracotta this is where I'll be getting that from. And the last portal leads to a savanna village where I found some tall grass I believe but I also use this area to get my hands on all the grass I needed to terraform around my base. As this is quite far away it wouldn't bother me to destroy the landscape here. That's basically all there is to show for in this world so far. However there is still a few more things I'd like to go over and talk about. For one, I want to show you some of these stats as I think this is a great time to show these. So here are the most important ones. Animals bred is mainly just the bees I needed for the honey farm. Chests opened is almost at 30,000. Distance by Elytra is almost at 3.5 million blocks. Mob kills are over 1 million from AFKing at all these different farms. Falker boxes opened is over 30,000 which is pretty insane. Then probably the most interesting stat, time played is at 18 days or 432 hours. Then here's a quick view of the most mined blocks. Broken tools are not really interesting and this is what the crafting stats look like. Tools used is mostly the pickaxe obviously and finally picked up items is mostly gold nuggets from the gold farm which I then crafted into gold ingots and blocks. And at last the most killed mob by far is the zombified piglin at over 600,000. So yeah these were the most important stats in my opinion. Then let's talk about a few other things I'd like to address. First up thank you so much for all the support. I really appreciate every single comment. It truly makes my day. Then I read some comments 
noticed that I should make the videos a little bit longer and I agree. I do want to include a little bit more of the process of planning and building these massive projects. So I'll try to make the episodes longer without artificially stretching them. Another important point is the upload schedule. I don't really have an upload schedule but so far I was usually sticking to a roughly two week rhythm. However, sadly that will change. The hardcore videos take much longer than just two weeks to make and I was only able to do that up until now because I have pre-recorded a lot of it and always stayed ahead of schedule. Now this will catch up with me around episode 7 of the Harker series. I will have to significantly reduce the frequency of uploading the Harker videos. However, I would like to make some other Minecraft videos that take much less time to plan, record and edit. These will be uploaded in between Harker episodes to still give you some content from me. I have only a few ideas of what videos I could make, so I'd really appreciate if you write down more ideas in the comment section below. But don't worry, the next two videos will still be uploaded in a two week rhythm and after that it's really uncertain how frequent I'll be able to upload. And as a last little teaser, I am currently also working on an interactive map for the hardcore world. This will be updated after every episode. Basically, there are different markers on the map to show you where everything is, maybe some lower attached and stuff like that. At least that's what I would like to do. I don't know when that will be ready or if it's even possible to achieve it the way I envision it. But yeah, I think it would be a really cool gadget for all of you guys. Well, 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 that's all of that. Now let's let this video come to an end as well. Next time we'll continue with episode 6 where I will hunt down all the advancements in the game. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this world tour and maybe found some inspiration for your own world as well. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.